seemingly insignificant building, what happens behind the wire fences, what a man carries home with him, and for security's sake will not speak of. These things are vital to Americans everywhere. If you were driving from Los Angeles to Salt Lake City on U.S. Highway 91, you'd pass through St. George, Utah, population 4,562, just a short way from the state line of Nevada. It's pre-dawn, five in the morning. Pretty deserted at this hour. Everything is closed down, everyone's asleep. Everyone, that is, except a milkman. Been delivering over the same route for 12 years. Never missed a day. And a police officer patrols the lonely downtown beat. And another night owl keeps his place open 24 hours for tourists coming through. Since the rest of the town was sound asleep, only our night owl saw it. That great flash in the western sky. An atomic bomb at the Nevada test site 140 miles to the west. But it's old stuff to St. George. Routine. They've seen a lot of them ever since 1951. Nothing to get excited about anymore. USA. This is the valley where the giant mushrooms grow. More atomic bombs have been exploded on these few hundred square miles of desert than on any other spot on the globe. Little bomb. Big bomb. bursts. And high bursts. I know the first one is one you'll always remember. It was in Nevada. It was a reasonably small device. It was just before dawn, so we see the light go off, and you're so busy watching the light the first time, and you forget about looking for the shock wave. And the shock wave comes across the desert when they hit you, just a big bang. Dust rises up in the air, and... Uh, you remember that one, and from then on you know it's coming, so there's no problem. The thing that surprised me, because I had never witnessed one in person before that one, was that you got a, an intense flash of heat for just a moment, and it was the heat from the explosion, and it traveled through the air. Of course, light travels the fastest, so you saw the flash and the bomb and the fireball, and then you felt the heat, and it was sometime after that, really, that the shock wave arrived, and, and you felt it in the airplane. And it wasn't a shockwave that shook you completely. It was just the airplane just sort of slid sideways. But by that time, the fireball was you know, way up and dissipated. There was no more fire in the sky. Normally, at Mercury, Nevada, we were about four miles was the closest we would get to stand in the open and photograph them. We used to put cameras in steel containers much closer and run them remotely. Maybe sometimes we could go a little closer if it was a small yield weapon. The smaller the weapon, the closer you get. I think the troops they had in the on Tumbler Snapper were like a mile and a half. Then I was about two miles back. I had some remote cameras in that area.
You have to document everything. You know, if you don't, you try to go back and remember what do we do here, or was this on the left or the right side? And uh, the same way you set up a building, you blow it apart. You want to see what's being done and uh, where the building is effective or whatever you're testing. How is the stress applied to it? While the shape drops, every aspect of its performance is captured for later evaluation in the laboratory. A truism that everyone can't be everywhere at the same time applies particularly to atomic tests. It is impossible for all of us to be on hand at the test site or all of us to ride in the drop plane or for any of us to be at ground zero at H hour. But there is a way to solve this problem and that is with photography. A camera can take us into the very interior of a nuclear weapon as the weaponeer makes final preparations for detonation. It shows us ground zero as it appears from 25,000 feet on the final bomb run. It slows down the split-second birth of a nuclear blast so that we can apply a tape measure to it. 